Um, I, I watched this the other night. I tried to get my kids to watch it with me. I tried to get them to come down and watch it with me here. Been unsuccessful um, in person. They're all teenagers. Um, but part of the reason I wanted them to watch it with me is the sense that uh, I want them to feel a sense of hope. And I, from watching this movie, I really, ironically enough, given the ending, you know, that he was, in fact, um, forced to resign. As I understand it right now, he's, um, he's in, um, he's, it's, they sought refuge in uh, the Indian, um, uh, where, where did the diplomats stay? The, the, um, embassy? Embassy, thank you. <laughs> Couldn't find the right words. He's in the, M the Indian embassy in Mali, um, and, and under threat of arrest by Gayum's loyalists. So, and you know, we haven't made a lot of progress, you know, on the international front, the Doha round uh, and the UN climate change negotiations hasn't, hasn't produced what was hoped for. But in spite of the fact that it can be kind of gloom, I actually draw a lot of hope from this. The fact that the president of the Maldives, um, you know, was able to have an impact on the global stage, I think is uh, just incredible. And that, uh, and he did. I mean, he, as an individual and as a representative of his nation, made a substantial difference. And I find that inspiring and hopeful. And you know, maybe, it's, maybe it's those of us who are drawn to this, this kind of line of work and thinking are, are fatally flawed in our optimism. But I, I don't know, what else is there to do but be optimistic? The other, I guess another um, reaction I had to the film was this intersection between human rights and democracy and climate change. And I think it's, it's one of the pieces that here in Vermont, um, it can be overlooked, although it shouldn't be, and I, I'll give a couple examples about why I think even here in, in um, our, our beautiful state, those, those things intersect. But you can see it when you travel overseas, and I was, I was fortunate enough to spend a chunk of time in China. and. Really, it came back, changed, transformed by it in a way that I didn't really expect. You know, I went over in part for my family to give them a different experience, a chance for myself to kind of see a different culture and to learn about what was going on in China, and also because I just kind of had this pragmatic sense. When you do the math, if you care about protecting the environment, that China is where it's at. If you if you want to get involved in doing something that makes a difference. They are so busily um, destroying the global ecosystem um, that if you, you, know, you want to do something meaningful, that's a good place to do it. But I came back, frankly, um, as discouraged as I thought I would be about some of the environmental impacts that are happening in China. But the unexpected thing for me was the sense that I had of how much I love our democracy and how much I love freedom of speech and how much I love the ability of people to criticize their government and to petition their government and to be involved in it and uh, to make a difference and to begin to you know, make the case for whatever it is that our values reflect. And I think climate change is, is one of those issues that really presents a fundamental values choice um, for our civilization. And I mean not just here in the US, but I mean globally. Um, we, we have some pretty substantial choices to make about who, who we are and, and how we behave on the earth. And then the human rights past part of it, the fact that they're, you know, as, you know, it's a truism, I suppose, that, you know, we're very privileged in the U.S. and we don't appreciate um, what we have. But when you travel and you see the, the depths of poverty overseas and then you realize that the people who are most vulnerable to climate change and the effects of climate change are the people that have the least. Um, it just for me in some ways drives home that as a as one of the more poignant and more um, not the right word the, the imperative the moral imperative is driven in part by the human rights as much as it is about the ecological health of the the world, as it is about the loss of coral reefs, as it is about the loss of our, you know, um, the species and the ecosystems and high altitude. There's a whole bunch of things that, you know, I can get really passionate about. But it's the human, humans that, uh, you know, I find the most powerful uh, piece of the, the risk about climate change. And the Maldives are the most 
obvious and time sensitive reflection of that. They, they face it sooner than the rest of us will face it. And they face it also because they, they have so little in terms of um, resources, unlike the US. So I, I don't know, those, were, those are just some of my observations. If, if we have time, I would love to chat a little bit about some of how I think we, and how this should be relevant to us in Vermont. Because um, I think there's lessons that we can draw from this story that you know, we can take into account as we make decisions about what our government does in this, this state. But. Great, thank you. Um, so I hadn't had the opportunity to watch the film, unfortunately. I have a year and a half year old at home who I love dearly, but don't often have a lot of time to do these kinds of things anymore. So I was really excited to see it, and I think I'm still sort of you know, ingesting the film. I thought it was ec extremely powerful. Um, I did note to Anna, we actually have an AmeriCorps member that I have the privilege of working with. He's a, he's a young um, native Vermonter who's working with us to support the 100 plus town energy committees that we, um, we are lucky enough to, to work with. Um, and he watched it and he came back to me and was effusive about how much it moved him. And which I thought, and it moved me too, but I was just, after seeing it now and seeing what, you know, what Nasheed fought for and, and hearing about what he fought for in Copenhagen and what he, you know, what he continues to wrestle with now, I think it's, it's, it's so essential to have leaders and to fight. And it really is a great example of what, a, you know, one person, what a few people can do. And so, I, I, I sometimes get extremely, um, you know, just sort of overwhelmed by the, the climate, you know, crisis and, and, and the fight that we have ahead. But I look at films like this and I think about my AmeriCorps member Keel and I think that, you know, we have people who want to fight and, and need to like, you know, are committed to digging in. And I think that um, this film, as I think David was alluding to, I think it's particularly interesting um, in terms of being a Vermonter because in that film it was fascinating for me to see. I think you guys will find this interesting too. I think there are several Vermonters in that film. When Nasheed got up on the stage um, at Copenhagen, he was introduced by Bill McKibben. Bill McKibben is, is a Vermonter and Bill McKibben also greeted him as he walked off the stage and right next to him was a young man named Will Bates. And Will Bates was uh, one of seven Middlebury students who helped uh, Bill McKibben essentially start 350.org, which is this now sort of international movement all about, you know, mobilizing action across the globe to, re uh, you know, get back down to 350 parts per million, the sort of global stabilization factor. So um, I had the privilege of working with those guys when they, before they, before this even started, because that movement was born here in the state of Vermont. Bill McKibben knocked on our door at VNRC and he said, climate change is real, I need to do something about it, I want to get arrested. And then he's like, I'm going to sit on the, on the steps of the um, Burlington City Hall and I'm going to get arrested. I need to make a statement. And, and then he found out that City Hall like, was like, sit there all you want, you know, sit there for days, we're not going to arrest you. So instead, um, he came with, up with this idea and I was lucky enough to work with him and some of those students that were in that film right there. Um, and we organized a five day walk across Vermont and this was in 2006. And um, it was the, the culminating event in Battery Park with Bernie Sanders and others, maybe some of you, um, was the biggest climate rally to date you know, in the United States and maybe globally. So I tell you that story because what that catalyzed was the Step It Up movement, which then was born into the 350.org movement, which is reflected there in that film. And so I tell you that because I actually get so much hope working on these issues in the state of Vermont because the power of you know, individuals to do something about this is really um, significant. It's also significant in, in, in adding your voice to the policy making conversation because we can't do it alone as individuals, so we need to start setting state policy and federal policy to get us there. And so um, I sort of say that um, in terms of there's hope in that film and there's hope in all of you and all of us here as sort of a united uh, Vermont. And uh, so I'm, I'm curious to hear what you thought and your, th your thoughts in general on 
what the heck do we do to sort of you know, combat the challenges that we face? And I continue to think about it as like, okay, well, how do we turn those challenges into opportunity? There's, there's a new economy to be created. Let's do it. So I would welcome your thoughts. I, all these events, I can't help but wonder how people got here. Uh, did you come by car by any chance? Or? I did come by car, unfortunately. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. I walked. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, that's, a, that's an interesting point, though. I think one of the things, I mean, I, I'm, I really don't like the idea of, of the, the messaging. A lot of the messaging around climate change um, often comes down to a set of, um, you know, what to, what to me feel like messages about guilt. I'm, I'm all for personal responsibility. I'm all for the fact that we need to, all of us, kind of accept our piece of how we change our lifestyles. But frankly, I, it's just so much bigger than any one of us. And part of the challenge is that the choice, we don't have sufficient choices. There's not enough, there's not enough transportation choices and housing choices and, and ways to live in your community. And we have, we have the architecture in Vermont of a, of a way to live on the planet that really is dramatically reduced in terms of the amount of carbon emissions. Um, you know, we have this architecture of small communities um, and village centers that are walkable and livable places where you can have, you can walk to the grocery store or with a short drive or bicycle ride, um, where you can live and work in the same community, where you're surrounded by um, vibrant working landscapes and natural landscapes. Um, that actually is, in, in many ways, in terms of a land use uh, and a way of living, a, Really, I mean, there's all these other benefits to it. There's water quality benefits, there's health benefits, there's kind of community benefits um, in terms of how we live with each other. But there's also um, substantial climate benefits in terms of carbon reduction. So I don't think it's as simple as saying to everybody, get out of your car and drive and, you know, and ride a bicycle. I'm all for that. And I think we should send those messages. But I think we have to, have to talk much more substantially about the way that we change some fairly fundamental policies that limit the choices that we have. Who here gets to pick what their source of energy for heat is? Who here gets to pick how they get to work? You know, most of us don't have those kinds of choices and don't have the time or resources to invest in some of the more creative technologies. Um, there, are, there are ways of living, I think, that, that are that allow us to exercise personal responsibility in a way that it doesn't feel like are really accessible to most people today. Yeah. Um, thinking in a larger system sense, um, I noticed one of the signs at Copenhagen was planet not profits. And it seems to me that the United States is set up on the capitalistic system for profit. And as long as that is the deciding factor in our policies for individuals, for corporations, for government. I don't think that we're going to make the progress we should. And I'm thinking of perhaps there's a contrast in China, and you would know more about this. China can make a massive decision from the top down. They're not a democracy. But in my small experience of visiting there, once they decide something, they make it happen. I saw them planting miles of trees to stop um, erosion. And I'm wondering if now that China is aware of air pollution, when the Olympics were there, it was a big factor. They tried to clean things up, and there's sickness and there's cost. Do you think that there's any hope that China will make a rapid switch to stop some of the global warming impacts that they now are producing because it's costing them money? I don't see that happening, see that. but I'm, I'm also, I'm not a China expert. You know, I, I lived there for a while. I've studied it for a few years. Um, I, you know, there's a saying um, among Chinese scholars that, you know, people who have been there less than six months are, are experts, but after that, you know, the place gets complicated pretty quickly. So, um, I mean, it's a big country, and it's clearly, uh, driven by profit, and the, the Communist Party is in fact the largest owner of the most of the um, enterprises, the corporate enterprises there, and they're, they're driven, from my perspective, primarily by a desire to maintain control and power and, and the lifestyles that they have. 
But I don't think they're evil. Um, I do think that the system they have is not one that's, that's likely to drive change unless you know, there's something transformational happens. And I, I also, I really, one of the things that I experienced there, and I think when we talk about capitalism and, and profit motives, and, I, and Gus Speth is a, is a guy to talk to, who's at the Vermont Law School, who's done some really incredible work and in writing on this topic about how we shift away beyond the, the capitalism that we have um, to something different. But what, what, what we have in terms of a democracy is like fresh air. Having lived in a, in a country where people were, were afraid to speak their minds, they were afraid to criticize their government. And I'm not talking about people on the street. I mean, academics, you know, um, people of, of means and, and um, education in China are terrified of their government. They don't, for good reason, don't want to speak out against it. I, I don't want to, there's just no way I would exchange you know, the kind of dramatic action that we need to combat climate change for a loss of those basic freedoms, having, having lived in that. And I also am not convinced that it would lead to that. I, I honestly think that the values that we hold as a country, and I see them, we're lucky, we're blessed in Vermont that we, we for the most part, share those values pretty deeply. We fight rapidly over the, the you know, the, the, the ridge lines, you know, that's the, the, and wind is, you know, that's, that's our fight of the, of the moment, but it's a, it's a luxury in some ways to be a, a public official in a state where that's the fight, where everybody recognizes the value of these resources. But I also think increasingly across this country, people are recognizing that there's this intersection between the quality of their lives and a set of, of ways of living that, that actually benefit us in terms of climate reduction. When you, you, know, you talk about national security and energy diversity and the, the, price, the sheer price of gasoline, all, this, all of a sudden, just because of the gas of internal combustion engines, we're seriously having car manufacturers sell battery electric vehicles and they've invested billions in hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. I don't know if those will transform the world, but they have the potential to. And I, I would just say about China, I think that, you know, I know that they're also, we've, begun to you know, ship a lot of our manufacturing to places like China, and, and they're also sort of le leading in the you know, research and innovation and design of, of clean energy technologies too. So they have an opportunity, as do we, to shift you know, the economy. I mean, we could and should be investing in that sort of innovation and research. And, and in the United States, China is, you know, unfortunately, we have created a system and a society that has subsidized things that are no longer and never were good for the planet. Now we need to switch and change the way we subsidize other things that are better for the planet and the world. Um, the one thing that when you, when you talked about, this is fascinating to me, and when you talked about who's digging into and concerned about chi climate change, I think two of the biggest entities that are concerned about climate change are, well, three, the Department of Defense, um, and I think the CIA, as well as insurance companies, I mean insurance companies, but like here you have the, de the, the Department of Defense is, is, is one of the most sort of active and concerned, you know, climate folks in the United States because of, I mean, I'm, I hate to say it, but like, like countries like the Maldives, I mean, there will be environmental and climate refugees and, you know, nations are going to have to ready for that. And, there, there's huge, you know, opportunity and sort of moral obligation to do everything we can to stop that or slow that or stem that, um, so, so that we avoid that kind of crisis. It's my understanding that the Department of Defense is so concerned because they're worried about the instability mm -hmm. that will result in. Yeah. Yep. Just, I just, just uh, recently, the uh, uh, Chinese chairman. Uh, said in his speech, uh, it's the first time that I was aware of it, that he was concerned about pollution in China and he wanted to do something about it. Do you especially think that there's any, um, any sincerity to, to what he said? Or, or I do, but I think, it's for, I think it's for the same reason the Department of Defense cares about it. It's political okay. instability in China. Is, yeah. That's the greatest risk associated with pollution. Yeah. Do, you, do you know anything? I can't remember what the initials um, stand from somewhere. I have a paper that describes it, but it was a long time ago. Something called the HARP program. 
in which for a long time it started over a huge area somewhere near Alaska where there's been um, overt, extremely overt manipulation of the weather. I mean, we're talking in, in disastrous ways. I can't mean this, H-A-A-R-P. And so there are parts of the um, Defense Department, I'm not sure, or parts of the military that have been involved in um, you know, doing some really disastrous things. There was some question in my mind as to whether some of, you know, some of their ignoring the statistics, like I remember hearing on the radio that the, the temperature of the ocean, um, it was on some late night radio program, the temperature of the ocean was raised to about 94 degrees, which was hotter than this guy who lived down in the, near the bio in Louisiana had ever seen it. And that was before the onset of Katrina. So, you know, I, I mean, this is, I, I'm not talking necessarily conspiracy, but I, I just don't trust any of those people. And I think what's necessary really is some hard line education of everybody on, on, on the front. You know, I mean, I, I live in an apartment I've been for years trying to get weatherization. It won't go through. The oil bill this past year was well over, I think, $2,500, which I pay for. I'm a member of an energy co-op. But, you know, breaking the shell of that kind of, you know, I would really love to be part of something that was forward moving. Um, in this particular town, I think they have not come to the forefront of things like, oh, I don't know, you know, housing that would be equitable for people. I, I heard some poor guy almost in tears today say, he was coming out of the dentist's office, he said, I, I'm already so broke and now they tell me there's no catamount. You know, people are facing on fronts a lot of, you know, there's no jobs. You know, Obama put in an appearance at Copenhagen. You know, the, and I knew someone who worked on climate, on soil science, right down the street. There was a gag order. Um, you know, it, this was working on climate science with Bush. They weren't allowed to even use the word dangerous or danger. You know, so so we have a lot of bad stuff that we've inherited that has to be kicked aside, and most people don't really understand. You know, and there's separations between people that may just be following the lifestyle that, that they, they hang on to because that's all they have, and the people on the top that have an obligation to get out there and do some grassroots, not only organizing, but education. I don't know. That's okay. but I, I, I mean, I think you, you raise a lot of really interesting and complicated points, and the one thing I would say is that, I mean, Look at what Nasheed, one human, did to change the conversation and the dynamic. And I think it's about being active. You know, I think it's about there's an urgent need to be engaged and active. You talked about weatherization. There, there's a bill under consideration in the legislature this uh, session that you know would really strengthen Vermont's commitment to helping Vermonters stop hemorrhaging dollars and heating the outdoors, but you know, times are tight, you know, the budget's tight. Okay, well, it's not gonna get any easier. So the thing is, it's an upfront investment now, it's a commitment that you make now, and unfortunately, you know, there's not a lot of political will to do anything that has the necessary money that's needed to move it forward, so it will die. And part of the reason I think it will die is because they didn't hear banging on the door from their constituents that I'm spending $2,500 this, you know, well, heating I season. Well, poverty and weatherization is generally for people who own their I mean, I mean, weatherization, uh, little weatherization, not only low income, but for all Vermonters. So, what are other, what did other people think of the film? Um, we, we talked just a little bit about things happening. Well, Sandy did something. I mean, I think you got to hear Blue Bird. And yeah. then you've got Christy. Yeah. Um, I, I, you got to admit, you, you agree then. Um, we had a drought in the Midwest. I don't know what it's, what's going to happen to it this summer. We certainly could get another Sandy because if, 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 if it is actually a climate change issue and the high up over Greenland that sort of pushes things into this, you know, coming in off the Atlantic and across the, the, the landscape instead of escaping into the North Atlantic. Um, you know, that, that finally, that, I mean, I, I hate to be cynical about politicians, but when there's waves coming over here, <laughs> the Jersey coast, you know, the, the, the beach communities, that gets their attention. <laughs> no, I absolutely agree. I think, I actually think here, in, in the Northeast generally, but also in Vermont, you know, post the 2011 floods in Irene, 
there is an awareness across the board. Um, there was an education that happened just by virtue of the fact of people being exposed to, a, you know, an extreme weather event that, you know, it, even though it was ranked as, you know, a 500 year flood, we've had, when you do the math, we've had um, a major flood of the scale of Irene every 37 years in Vermont for the past, you know, 80 or so years. I mean, we've had had a lot of that flooding, so when you, and they're getting more and more frequent. So you can't ignore the math, and then the public feels it. And I think right now is one of those ideal points to take some action um, in response to that. For instance, I mean, like I said, there are, there are places where, you know, if you did a Venn diagram and you said, you know, let's, we care about the environment, and that's one circle, and we care about our economy, and that's another circle, and we care about the livability of our communities, and that's another circle. And there's public policies to achieve all of those things. There's a set of public policies that land smack in the middle that serve all of those things, that serve prosperity, they serve the quality of our life, and they serve environmental protection and reduction of climate change. And I think in the aftermath of Irene, for instance, one of the things we've been looking at are um, you know, the fact that you, floodplains you know, are this critical asset in terms of protecting Montpelier, for instance, or Waterbury. There's a whole set of floodplains upstream of us and downstream of us and upstream of Waterbury that are in Middlesex that are critical to protecting those communities. They also provide fundamental protection for a set of habitat and you know, water quality protections. Um, and they're part of protecting our agricultural economy and our working force. There's like a whole set of things that are valuable about that. And if you're gonna provide housing for people, then you invest in communities like Montpelier and Waterbury and you protect those floodplains. That's one of those Venn diagrams like everything connects. There's a lot of um, value in that. There's also some democratic process kinds of things that we have to work through because to get to that place means making a different kind, kinds of decisions about where we allow development to occur and who makes those decisions. Those are tough issues to work through. Yeah, but in, in in New Jersey, even you have so many political barriers in terms of volunteerism. You can't, I mean, Bob Vermont is so, uh, it allows for uh, people to work together from all phases of public government. But in New Jersey, that's not true. So the Sandy Shoreline just, that was the town's, uh, hurt by Sandy, sit there because of bureaucracy. So nothing happens. So it's a political issue. Very much so there. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. I agree. I mean, I, I do. I see this strong intersection between a strong democracy and our ability to address these issues. Because I think, it, going back to the, this concept also, that there's, these are connected to human justice and basic rights issues. You know, we have people in our community that can't afford to live in homes, who live in, um, in, in where, where they can live, which is often in, in floodplains where mobile home parks have been constructed. They're the most vulnerable people and they're the least empowered in our community. If you can figure out how to empower those folks to be more engaged and more influential, we actually have a whole set of gains that cut across human rights, economics, and climate change. Has there uh, any individual or organization that has attempted to quantify how the world gets to 350? I mean, we talk about moving towards it, but it's not quantified. What do you do when it comes down to what should individual nations do? You know, I mean, it's, uh, up in the air. We actually have talked to you about even doing something like that specifically for the state of Vermont. I mean, the state of Vermont has an energy plan, you know, and has state goals to get to 90% renewable energy, you know, portfolio by 2050. And yet, we have that plan and we have a lot of recommendations for how to get there, but we don't have a roadmap. I definitely do not think that the roadmap, as sort of you're articulating, exists for the world, but I feel like we have that roadmap. We know that we need to dramatically reduce the energy that we use, that's through conservation and efficiency, and we need, need to transition you know, as fast as possible to renewable power. I mean, there's, you know, there's 
non-renewables and there's renewables, and the non-renewables are, are dirty and they're running out and they're increasingly expensive. I mean, we have, you know, there's a conversation right now in the state of Vermont in terms of being a conduit to move tar sands oil, you know, reverse the flow of a 60-year-old pipeline um, and start moving, you know, instead of shipping crude oil, you know, west, we're going to start moving, you know, the dirtiest oil on the planet, you know, to market because we're feeding our fossil fuel fix. And the reality is that we need to get off of fossil fuels and figure out another way to move to clean energy. So the roadmap that you're articulating, I sure wish someone would do that, but I don't. I think that we have it conceptually, but I don't think we have it in sort of maybe the way that you're articulating. What was the roadmap in the, the Copenhagen Agreement? What were the specifics of that? Do you know? I mean, there, there, there are targets for for nations, and I don't think they're specifically like, you know, you know, you need to do such and such and such. I think it's like. Every single nation knows what, how many power plants that they have and the kinds of strategies they could get you know, those, those polluters to reduce their emissions, that sort of thing. I haven't actually you know, looked in, in enough detail to answer specifically, but I think broadly it's left up to the nations to figure out how to do it, but the goal is in, you know, to reduce the emissions in some way. I mean, the breakthrough of Copenhagen was that you had the US and, and China and the developing nations all signed on. Um, but they didn't commit to anything. They didn't even commit to the Kyoto um, limits and requirements. Those remain in place, but they've been pushed out, you know, another five, ten years. I don't know what the latest, you know, deadline is. Um, in theory, they, you know, those limits, if, if they would come to agreement and they failed at Doha, which is the latest round, um, if, if, they, if they came to a, a agreement on what those limits should be, it would theoretically drive action. The next challenge you get to is even if they do that, international agreements are notorious for being violated. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating kind of, it can start to feel hopeless. On the other hand, you know, we, we actually are seeing dramatic reductions in car, you know, the fluorocarbons in the atmosphere. Um, we've seen, you know, within a few decades, a fairly dramatic reversal. And when, I don't know, was the, does anyone remember when the Montreal Protocol was signed, like mid '80s, late '80s. It's been, you know, it's just been a, a couple or so decades, and we've already seen a change. And that was an international protocol. It is theoretically possible. What's caused that change? Do you know the reduction? It was um, mandatory. <laughs> Montreal Protocol prohibited the sale of chlorofluorocarbons, oh. and and it has not been fully honored. But it was honored by enough of the developed countries that it made a difference. Also, it, did, it didn't take a lot of people. It took some um, CEOs and companies that were in, in the semiconductors that were using a lot of those for, for cleaning up, and then the, the, the GEs that have to produce refrigerants. So mm -hmm. it wasn't like, it, it wasn't anywhere, I mean, there was near as for breaching, you could actually identify who had to change. Yeah. It's true, but I'll say, I, it, you're, I, everything you say is exactly true, but I'll also say, just being the eternal optimist again, at the time, you and she. when I was in, <laughs> the she, yeah, when, but I, at the time, I recall that going through, at the time, there was a sense of hopelessness about that. Like, when there's a hole in the ozone, you know, that's created by global emissions, everybody was thinking, how are we going to possibly make a difference? Here we are a couple of decades later, and it did. Which is, so I'm not saying that this is as simple, but it, it gives me a sense that you can look to international agreements and have them make some, have some consequence. The other thing is, there is, you know, part of what we have in Vermont is this ability to demonstrate a way of living on the landscape that can be a model. There are actually lots of scholars from China who are coming and studying in, in Vermont who are trying to figure out how it is that we live a prosperous, uh, meaningful life on the landscape. Um, and are trying to figure out how to take that model back to China. Um, I, that gives me some hope for the work that we're doing here. I also, I recently came back from a conference with the auto manufacturers who have invested billions of dollars in battery electric vehicles and hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. And you, know, you, you can have mixed feelings about it. There, there's a, a degree to which um, you know, sh sh just sh simply shifting to a, you know, that set of um, fuels is just shifting from 
you know, gas to coal-fired you know, energy to the extent that most of our electricity in the U.S. comes from coal. But it holds out the promise of a future in which we use electricity generation from renewables resources to power our vehicles. And it holds out the hope that we could have, you know, we could shift in a way uh, our, that doesn't compromise our quality of life and lifestyles to something that's dramatic in terms of reductions of CO2. And here in Vermont, because the you know, predominance of our energy comes from hydropower, we actually, by investing in electric vehicles and infrastructure to support that, um, could have a dramatic reduction in our contribution, which in our biggest contribution in this state is from transportation. So if we were able to tackle that, we'd be a long way towards achieving the goals on the energy plan. So I'm, I've recently become pretty excited about trying to figure out ways that we can help the car dealers sell more electric vehicles in this state because it feels like something that's meaningful, would make a substantial difference. And if we can accomplish, I, I also feel like in terms of public education, what the public needs to see, what we all, what I need to see is that we can do something, that there are steps we can take that make meaningful progress. That gives us hope to build on that we can then take the next step and the next step and so on. Did you even say something that uh, Vermont is not investing right now in anything having to do with electric cars, I don't think? We are. Oh, we are? Is yeah. We, we, there's some. Um, <coughs> A little. I mean, we've, I mean, we've taken the first baby steps. And there's actually two different bills, I think, under consideration in the legislature that would study, you know, one of them, the, the biggest piece of it is like studying, you know, what, what does electric vehicle, you know, transformation look like in the state of Vermont? I mean, how to site, you know, charging stations, like what, I mean, what does it look like? So we need to explore that. So there's definitely movement afoot in the state of Vermont. So there, there's, there's, a, there's an initiative called Drive Electric Vermont that's catching, that's you know gaining some momentum that you could look into to, to learn a little bit more about what's moving forward in this conversation in Vermont. Um, this is another way in which Vermont can be a leader even though we're so tiny. Um, governor Shumlin is nationally you know, one of the few governors that is speaking out on the issue of climate change. And as a consequence, we have a pretty strong alignment right now with New York, um, Maryland, California, Washington, Oregon, um, many of the other Northeast states around, uh, and we're on the verge of signing a memorandum of understanding among all those states that will um, basically show that these, there's a set of states that are committed to promoting electric vehicles as um, an important priority. And when you get, you know, that's a pretty substantial segment of the U.S. population when you add up all those states. And the governor signed an agreement with uh, Canada and the, and the Eastern um, New England governors, right, the commitment to start an electric vehicle corridor down from Montreal sure. to Boston. So yeah, we're kind of, we're tucked in between, you know, we've got Montreal on one side and the <laughs> whole Northeast corridor on the other. And um, if yeah. we can, if we can put in place the right infrastructure, um, we can make it possible so that, you know, um, it's people will it'll be worth investing in yeah. electric vehicles and knowing that you can have access to that full um, that full corridor. Like for instance, you know, one of the things we're we're working on would be the idea that if you um, if we can get the states into a compact, all the states would have would honor each other's essentially. You know, you'd get an electric vehicle license plate, and if you're driving down to Boston, you can use the HOV lane. You can park for free. You know, there will be a, you know, you pay no tolls as you go down to Washington, D.C. Um, there's, you know, we'll see. One of the things that they've experienced out in California is when you start adding those things up, the, the cost curve is actually bending on electric vehicles such that the, um, the savings that you have on the, the cost of fuel make up um, for the, the extra cost that you pay up front for the vehicle at this point within three to five years. And you can bend it even further when you start adding in these kind of government um, government incentives like HOV lanes and free parking and free tolls. Which, thankfully, we don't have here in the state of Vermont. Yeah, well, it won't benefit us that way. <laughs> Why don't you suggest to Governor Shumlin that he get an electric car? Serious. <laughs> well, what is your position as commissioner on uh, wind, wind power in Vermont, or in general? I, I think wind is a, a critical part of our energy future. And I also think there's places, uh, there's also places where wind shouldn't happen because like the, where, the environmental harms are too great. Yeah. Like where should it not happen? 
I think it's a specific conversation about site by site. I don't, oh, I don't have a, like a, a broad based answer but to that. You in other words, you're not saying in the entire state of Vermont it should not happen. Oh no, I think there's definitely when places in Vermont where it has happened and should have happened and there's places where it's been proposed where it shouldn't. And some of that's playing out before my department right now. Great. Well, thank you all for coming and thank you both. This was a great conversation. So. Thank you. Thank you.